Good afternoon. I'm Andreas Gangilaris, serving our university as Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Provost. I would like to welcome everyone to this virtual edition of Chancellor Jones' annual State of the University Address. <clears throat> we'll begin with our land acknowledgement statement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has the responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskeskia, Piancaso, Weya, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sok, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary to acknowledge these tribal nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community, inclusive of all our differences with native peoples at the core of our efforts. Once again, welcome to this live streamed version of the Chancellor's annual State of the University Address. In just a moment, I will be turning the Zoom window over to the Chancellor for his remarks. Following his address, I will join Chancellor Jones in responding to questions that members of our community submitted in advance of this event. So with that, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Chancellor Robert Jones to give, up, give us his perspective on the state of our university today. Chancellor Jones. Thank you, Provost Kangalaris, and thank you all for taking the time out to join us today. While it may seem somewhat counterintuitive, I want to open my State of the University address with someone else's words. Although they were spoken more than 152 years ago, there may not have been a time during that period where they were more relevant. It was on March 16th this past spring when I sent a difficult message announcing the end of face-to-face -face instruction and asked our students to return home if possible. Never in my career would I have imagined sending such a note, nor would I have imagined the landscape that we've had to navigate since then. In a year that has been so hard, so challenging, it often feels like it's just one layer of a darkness placed on top of another. I find inspiration in the words of John Milton Gregory the first leader of our university, when he said, and I quote, it is no ordinary work which we set to do and it comes to us under no ordinary circumstances. We're not here to reproduce in this new locality, some old and well known style of college and university. The hungry eyes of toiling millions are turned with mangled hope and fear upon us to see what new and better solutions we can possibly offer of the great problems on which their well-being and destiny depends." Unquote. These words were spoken during the inauguration of this university. And coincidentally, they were delivered on March 11th, 1868, almost exactly 152 years to the day of my COVID-19 decision last spring. This has certainly become one of my favorite quotes and I've used it several times during my tenure as chancellor. The first time was the celebration launching our sesquicentennial and you have probably seen it on the inside cover of our strategic plan, the next 150. But it has never resonated as loud and as clearly as it does today. I believe that there's no time when we are in more need of Gregory's hope and vision. 
And there cannot be any time when the circumstances of our society have called out louder to us for help. These are most certainly the days of mingled hope and fears, and we are certainly confronted with probably one of the greatest challenges and greatest problems of our generation. These are the days when no ordinary work will be enough or sufficient. These are the days when new and better solutions are absolutely critically needed. These are certainly the days, I believe, for which this university was created. And I am so proud that throughout these months of unprecedented difficulties and constant uncertainty, our students, our faculty, and our staff have displayed leadership and compassion that is only matched by the innovation of spirit and their strength of character. The only words that does justice to the state of the university as I see around us is resilient. And for the first time in my tenure here, I am going to overstep my start authority as chancellor and say that I believe that resilience is in fact the hallmark of our entire community this year. I must use this opportunity to express my profound gratitude for the leadership, the collaboration, determination that we have seen in action across this county since January, even before the COVID crisis had really reached this community. We have worked together as partners in name and in true practice every step of the way. There is, this is certainly no accident. It is the dividend of many years of building honest and open relationships between the university and our community. And we have used that foundation to create what I describe as a community ecosystem of resilience and trust. And that is why Champaign County is a national model of how truly an engaged university and community strengthen each other, even in the most difficult of times. No one in our living memory has ever operated a university through a global pandemic. There's certainly no guidebook for what we are doing. The world changed virtually overnight in March for this university and for every person connecting to it. The easy way out certainly would have been to put our heads down and to wait out and hope for the best on the other side of this pandemic storm. But instead, the members of this university in our community chose to boldly show leadership in a crisis where, to be brutally honest, that kind of leadership has been very, very rare in supply. In the course of about 12 days, we had to basically rethink almost every operational and programmatic element of this university. We reinvented the educational experience here. We expanded access without sacrificing quality, and we laid the foundations for new approaches to improving the university even after the pandemic is behind us. We retooled, reorganized, restarted one of the most massive research enterprises in the nation. We invented and implemented an unmatched COVID-19 mitigation ecosystem that integrates innovative epidemiological modeling and saliva-based testing with an app-based notification system and digital contact tracing. And all of this was designed with one single purpose in mind, and that was to keep our university and our community as safe as possible. We began the semester with in-person instruction, residential experiences that brought more than 35,000 additional people into our community while dropping our local positivity rate nearly by a factor of five. We opened the year with a record enrollment of 52,302 students despite the global challenges. And we are celebrating the most diverse undergraduate class in our history. So these are the things I am thinking about when I tell you that we are a university demonstrating the power of resilience. 
But while we can certainly take pride in that resilience, we must always balance it with compassion and empathy. The human impact of this persistent crisis on our students, our staff, and our faculty must be acknowledged and it must be addressed. This seamlessly ended endless cycle of uncertainty and anxiety compounded by the isolation and loss of human connection really grinds and weighs on us all very heavily. We worry about those who we cannot connect with and those who are not with us. We're concerned about the health of our families. We see the devastation and the lasting economic impact on those in our community. So these are the metrics by which we are measuring the human cost of COVID-19. Mental health and self-care must be priorities for each and every one of us individually. And they must also be institutional points of emphasis and investments throughout the duration of the pandemic. To be clear, we must stay laser focused on preserving the excellence of our university. But as my colleague, Provost Andreas Kangelaris says, the pursuit of quality without an equal commitment to compassion will never be acceptable here at Illinois. So folks, I know this is hard. I know we are all very tired. In part because it's hard to see when it will all end but we must continue to take care of one another and we must find ways to put our hands out to help lift up our friends and our families and our community members when we see them in need. And we cannot be ashamed to reach out for help when we need it ourselves. We want to move forward, but we cannot move forward while leaving others behind. Unfortunately, we must also have a frank and open conversation about the financial implications of the pandemic and the economic conditions that are likely to come. The impact of two years of COVID-19 will last for decades at least. And so we're thinking about how we need to begin to position ourselves now to face the world and the environment that will be waiting on the other side of this pandemic. From day one of the crisis, our priority has been to maximize the safety of everyone in our community. And I am so very proud to say that the choices that we have made during this pandemic have been guided by science, by evidence and advice from state and local public health experts, not by the cost of taking those actions. But this pandemic has been and will continue to be extremely costly. So establishing and operating our testing program along this semester has cost us about $16 million. Right now, we are estimating that the financial impact from March through the end of this calendar year to exceed $191 million. And we have to assume that we are going to see costs and losses continue into the spring semester. So, so, so far, our state budget has remained stable, but the economic impact on our state is going to be massive as well. So while we are pleased that our governor and the state legislature have noticed their and expressed their support for us, we have to make contingency plans that include a significant reduction in state funding in the coming years. So to be very clear, we're not panicking folks because that's not what we do at Illinois. But the 2016, 2017 state budget crisis taught us a lot of valuable lessons about navigating very difficult financial times. So although we're not panicking, but we are making some strategic reductions right now. And we're working with the colleges and units to identify a combination of revenue growth opportunities concurrent with spending cuts that will let us protect our core missions. And we 
and this is going to be a multi-year challenge, folks. And we're relying and we're laying the groundwork now to address it with a multi-year strategic approach. This is clearly the year of COVID-19. And that crisis has dominated our collective attention and most of our energies. But I would also suggest that this pandemic has also directed a new light on a persistent, insidious twin crisis of systemic racism and generationally embedded racial disparity affecting our societies. The list of lost lives and senseless death like those we saw this past summer across Minnesota, Kentucky, and elsewhere seems to grow each day. COVID-19 pandemic has really starkly exposed the huge racial disparity in health and in wellness. Skin color continues to be a major determinant of someone's educational and economic mobility. These issues of embedded injustice and inequality have been intensified and actually accelerated by the pandemic. But unlike the virus, they will not be resolved with the relative convenience and ease of a vaccine. And the ensuing rebuilding and recovery will not be hollow, it has to be transparent, and it's insufficient if it is constructed on the same platform that is so decayed and so compromised and so embedded by social injustice, inequality, religious intolerance, and by the alarming loss of respect for human dignity in our national political discourse. Our society deserves a better foundation. And this is the goal of our call to action to end racism and social injustice that we announced this summer. It is time to focus the vast and unmatched intellectual and scholarly talent of this 21st century land-grant university on finding effective and innovative solutions to these persistent and destructive issues. So we are going to act in ways that will be comprehensive, that will be measurable, strategic, thoughtful, transparent, and rapid. And we must do so with the same sense of urgency, creativity, and purpose that we have seen in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Navigating the duration of the pandemic, helping our community and our state and our world, we build from it, addressing systemic racism that has been generationally embedded in our society, I don't believe anyone would ever truthfully accuse our university of setting low goals and expectations. But we're not starting from the beginning here. We have a very strong foundation and we have a clear and focused path forward to work within our strategic plan and our strategic framework, the next 150. Practicalities of circumstances may slow some of the initiatives that we've outlined, but circumstances will not change, derail, destroy the ambitious and important strategic goals that we have laid out. If anything, these twin crises have brought the relevance of our plan into crystal clear focus and into high resolutions. So I challenge and encourage you to read the next 150 and find a single goal or value or priority that has not been on prominent display in our actions during this COVID-19 year. From health and wellness to innovation discoveries to, uh, to addressing disparities, inequalities of access to education, to finding new opportunities to steward our resources this year has really demonstrated the relevance and the importance of our plan, even in the most dramatic manner imaginable. And given the likely generational impact of COVID-19 on our state and even the time horizon suggested by the name of our plan, the next 150, seems to be suddenly more accurate and appropriate. 
Now, I realize that my comments today are not as exuberant or joyful as they've been in period, previous iterations of this address. But above all, this is a place known for being honest and for telling things as they truly are. But I don't want to leave this conversation with the impression that, there, that these challenges that we face are insurmountable, nor do I want anyone to mistakenly believe that even a global pandemic can overshadow the spirit and the innovation and creativity and the power of discovery that has been the hallmark of this university for a century and a half and counting. So even in the midst of the crisis, we have moved forward here at Illinois. For example, this fall, we saw one of the most academically talented, most diverse and most accomplished freshman class in the history of this university join us. Overall, we saw our enrollment actually grow to a record high level when many have predicted the college attendance would plummet. The Humanities Research Institute was awarded a new $5 million research grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which once again, we see this university recognized as a leading light in scholarship in the humanities. The Granger College of Engineering was named a leading partner in two of the five Department of Energy, Quantum Information and Science Research Centers established this year. Two of seven new federally research institutes and in artificial intelligence will be centered right here at the University of Illinois at Vanna Champaign. And once again, we are at the top spot of NSF funding, which means that there's no other university in this nation that was awarded more funding this past year than the University of Illinois. And our friends, and our alums continue to demonstrate their confidence in us with their gifts to our With Illinois philanthropic campaign. Today, we are more than 95% of the way toward the goal of raising $2.25 billion. And I remind you that this was the largest campaign in our history, and we are going to get there ahead of schedule and we're going to do so in during one of the most challenging years in living memory. And this week, we got the news that three of our members of our faculty, two of three of our most distinguished faculty members were listed as one of the most influential and frequently cited researchers in the world. And so we're very, very pleased with that. And if you need any additional evidence, that you cannot keep Illinois down even during the pandemic. I'll give you this. Illinois graduate and astronaut Mike Hopkins made his return to space on Sunday night. And as I speak, he is orbiting aboard the International Space Station. A lot of universities like to tell their graduates, the sky is the limit. Mike Hopkins is living proof that here at Illinois, that's not aiming nearly high enough. And I also might add, based on the slide I think you are looking at right now, we promise you that when we launched our branding and marketing campaign, that it was gonna be out of this world. And so Mike, thank you for helping me to make that dream come true. Last year in the speech, I suggested the single most important contribution this university offers our society is very simple and is very powerful and it's a cause for hope. Hope for things like a simple, a quick test that can keep families and communities safe from the frightening and deadly virus. Hope for a path forward to put the to rest finally and forever the inequalities and injustices that continue to break the spirit and hold far too many of us down. Hope for transformational educational opportunities that cannot be disputed and disrupted even by a global pandemic. Folks, we are in the business of giving people hope 
when it might seem like there's none to be found. So I've described the state of our university today as resilient. It is from that resilience that those who need us most in the world today draw hope that the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign will lead them to a new and better solution to the great problems on which their well-being and destiny depend. I truly believe the work we all do together will change lives, it will improve the world around us, and it will help everyone to reimagine the possibilities for a better life and for a better future. I am deeply humbled and grateful to lead this great university today. And that is the state of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as I see it on November 19, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chancellor Jones, for your inspirational remarks. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on the state of the university in this truly unusual and uncertain year. I think now it's time to uh, address the questions that uh, our campus community submitted to us in advance of this state of the university address. We received a fairly large number of questions, more than 100. And fortunately, they seem to fall into a fairly clear set of categories and I hope we will be able to cover a lot of them during the time we have left. So if you're ready, uh, why don't we get started with one of the most frequently asked questions we received. And Chancellor, I think this question is really for you. With so much difference of opinion on how to respond to COVID-19, how is the university making decisions on our operations? Well, you're right, Andreas, that is a frequently asked question. And uh, let me try to answer it as succinctly as possible. There are different opinions about how to respond. And I want to assure you of something that you heard uh, at least twice uh, during my State of the University address. Uh, every one of our decision was made with the goal in mind of keeping our university safe. Each one of those decisions were steeped and the best knowledge, the best science that we had available to us. So we use scientific based approaches to make each and every one of those decisions. We rely very heavily on evidence and information and advice from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, that was critically important and vital to each and every decision. We definitely collaborated very, very seamlessly in ways that a lot of communities in with our uh, our Illinois Public Health Department and our local health district, uh, who became absolutely critically important partners in a lot of this decision making, not only in making the decision, but implementing those decisions. And we are looking at also the academic research, not only the research that's done by our own faculty, but research that is done across the nation and across the world as a critical source of information in our decision making. And uh, most of us are part of many different constituency groups. So you have a chance to discuss what other university provosts are doing around the country, across the Big Ten and around the nation. And I have the same opportunity to have similar discussions with my colleagues across the nation. So this is a data information rich decision making process that we have implemented. And it's also important to note that uh, we've learned a lot from our own experiences. It's just amazing how much our enormous testing capability has also been in a real time educational experience, providing data to help us kind of revise some of our thinkings and some of our strategy if needed. And so it has been data rich, data driven. And we will continue to examine the work that's being done by ourselves and others uh, so that we continue to make the best decision possible for our community. Thank you, Chancellor Jones, and you're absolutely right. I think uh, this university has been an uh, uh, exemplary in the way we have been uh, using all the information provided to us and, of course, uh, relying on our talented people to put forward the best plan, the most responsible plan. 
I would like to move to the next question, which is a question that is of significant uh, interest to our students. Uh, last semester, we offered the option to take courses for credit, not credit. Why is that option not available this semester? Will it be offered in the spring? Uh, so Chancellor, let me answer this question. Um, we have been listening to student concerns and there are many. We have been listening to faculty concerns and, and uh, student advisors. And we know how challenging this semester has been. And uh, as we speak, the Academic Senate is considering policy modifications to provide students with additional flexibility and academic options for this semester. The Senate is uh, considering a proposal to extend the drop deadline uh, to December 18, and also an option for students to convert a failing grade to a form that does not factor into their grade point average. A meeting of the Academic Senate is scheduled for tomorrow, Friday, and we hope to announce their decision soon. Let me also say that these are decisions for this fall semester and most definitely as we move into the spring semester, we are going to be considering options for the spring semester as well. Now, Chancellor, I would like to move to a question that uh, I know is of significant concern to, to you and to all of us. Uh, here's the question. This has been a difficult semester for everyone. How are you supporting our students with mental health resources? What about faculty and staff? Chancellor? Thank you, Andres. And uh, the question is also spot on. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, this has uh, been a very difficult period. There's no roadmap. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty. And uh, mental health issues within the undergraduate student population has been something that has been with us for several decades now. I think most universities across this country has reported uh, about 40% of uh, the incoming students almost every year come to their university with some significant challenges in this regard. Now you layer on top of this, the stress and the toils of this pandemic, you do have a situation that's uh, even more of more concern and we have to be much more vi uh, vigilant about how we address this. And so this is a very challenging time for us all and we have to row together to try to uh, address these issues. Uh, when it became very apparent that our counseling center would not be able to offer traditional in-person services, even though we had added additional counselors, we're glad that we did that before the pandemic, the uh, resources uh, needed to be invested to ensure that our Illinois student would continue to have access to these services. So basically we had to do the same thing that we did with instruction. We had to flip to a more uh, uh, web-based approach, uh, telehealth uh, system in order to continue to make these uh, services available. So all of our clinical staff were trained in telehealth and we also went about adapting and modifying policies and procedures that needed to be revised and rewritten uh, accordingly, uh, we instituted a HIPAA compliant video platform on which to deliver this uh, telehealth uh, by Zoom was added to ensure that the telehealth services were provided in a safe and in a confidential fashion. And the outreach and prevention services also had to be modified so that students could engage and access these services online. And we know our faculty and our staff were impacted by this as well. And uh, one of the things that because of what we were hearing from faculty and staff and particularly our students, and Provost Cangelaris would tell you with several meetings with the faculty senate or with different student constituency groups, the resounding narratives is about the impact of this semester on their mental health and sense of well-being. So Provost Kangalaris and I have just recently established a group that includes faculty, staff, and students to address the mental health issues in our community uh, and how to try to find new and innovative ways to address that beyond what we're doing so far. And part of it, we hope, is going to create additional opportunities 
for there to be more human contact because what we're hearing, that is the biggest challenge we face is that loss of human contact, uh, sometimes both in the classroom and out of the classroom and in informal situation. We're pleased to announce I think Andreas, if I remember correctly, the first meeting of that group is going to be this Monday. And I can tell you, we will be looking at the best practices and the most innovative strategies to be brought to bear as we continue to try to do all we can to address the very, very pressing issue of the state of mental health issues during the middle of this pandemic. You're right, Chancellor. The first meeting is scheduled for Monday, and I will tell you that uh, uh, we continue to receive uh, recommendations, suggestions by our students and faculty about ways in which we can uh, uh, approach this significant challenge in more creative, innovative ways. So I'm very optimistic and hopeful that uh, as we move into the spring semester, a good deal of, of, uh, of new ways is going to become available to us to deal with this stressful period for all of us. The next question is a question that uh, I understand very well, all of us understand very well, and it goes as follows. Is it possible for international students to take a fully online semester for spring 2021? Um, we know that uh, last uh, fall we were confronted with some uh, uh, very strange expectations of our students, international students, to and not be able to enroll until they were, unless they were able to take uh, in-person courses. And let me tell you that um, like the fall semester, the spring semester will include a blend of in-person and remote instruction to, and will make sure that uh, our international students have access to uh, some in-person courses for, for certain. I want to emphasize that the US Student and Exchange Visitor Program has not yet issued any guidance about visa enrollment implications for our international students taking a fully online schedule in spring 2021. I am optimistic that, that we're not going to encounter, encounter any challenges. And in any case, the university will make sure that we keep our international students updated as this information becomes available. On to the next question, Chancellor, now. Um, a question that I know you have heard before multiple times. How are we supporting our essential workers? Why, why aren't we providing them hazard pay? Well, this is the question that we have received quite often. And let me start by saying uh, we have uh, thorough and safe guidelines in place uh, for our essential workers. And this was part of uh, the process that uh, Provost Cangalares, Magdi Lorenzo, and the facilities and services, people, student affairs, all of us spent a lot of time and attention to making sure that our essential workers were as safe as possible. We have uh, looked at the facilities and practices and policies within facility services uh, to make sure that those policies reflected our great concern and commitment to keep uh, all of our workers and essential workers as safe as possible. We have to make sure that they have uh, frequent access to our rest, rapid testing protocol. And uh, one of those decisions involves some of those individuals testing three times per week rather than twice per week in order to make sure that we're keeping them as safe as possible. We have uh, social distancing and face covering requirements in place across this campus and for those spaces in which these people work and are employed as well. And our facilities and services colleagues, I think, have truly done an amazing job with their thorough and consistent cleaning and sanitizing of our campus environment, our classrooms, our laboratories, office space, et cetera. They have done exceptional work, and uh, we are very, very proud of what they've been able to do. Uh, in facilities uh, where we've had uh, uh, some students in isolation and quarantine has been the place where we have been able to provide some modest increases in pay for employees in those positions because they are perhaps more than anyone on the front line of uh, interfacing with people that have contracted COVID-19. And we uh, done all that we can to keep them safe 
and to reward them in some way for the work that we're asking them to do. And so we're very, very appreciative of all they do and glad that we could provide a bit more uh, pay to recognize their, their, their contributions to keeping us all safe. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, the next question has to do with uh, our decision about uh, uh, not having a spring break um, in the spring semester. And um, uh, let me let me uh, address the question, why isn't the university having a spring, spring break? Uh, let me first of all say that, uh, that um, any decision about changes to the academic calendar has to be approved by the academic senate and as we were looking into the spring semester, uh, and before engaging with the, the academic senate for the discussion about it, uh, a number of groups and stakeholders were consulted on this on this uh, proposal to uh, not have a spring break. Uh, as uh, we all know, our uh, COVID-19 academics team spent, which is guiding us in many of the considerations of what to do with our academics this year. Uh, spent some time debating this issue. Uh, the COVID-19 Executive Steering Committee, I want to emphasize the SEAL team. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we have been doing this past semester is paying attention to all the, the mistakes we have been made, uh, that have been made, all the, the, the lessons we have learned and how do we use them uh, as we move forward to position ourselves for better uh, success uh, in the next semester. Our Council of Deans uh, were consulted and, and students and others. And uh, the proposal, uh, which was developed also in close consultation with health experts, was motivated by the desire to limit spread of COVID-19 virus and maximize the safety of the campus and the local community. Um, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and other health experts tell us that uh, travel Travel in and out of communities presents a high risk of spreading the infection. This is one of the things that all of us are experiencing uh, during this period of the second wave in our communities with uh, COVID-19. And you know, all of these considerations, as you, as you mentioned, Chancellor, we have been talking with other provosts, not only in the Big Ten, but across the nation, uh, are considerations that many universities took into account and made similar changes that we, we made about our academic calendar. I want to emphasize the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, not only do we have enough um, a, a gradual transition back, you look at the number of days that we essentially have as, as break days for the spring semester, we have the first week of the semester, as well as three uh, days that we have uh, intersected in our full semester program in a way that we provide the opportunity for our students and the community to relax a little bit. Uh, obviously, we would prefer to follow a regular academic calendar, including having spring break, but uh, these are unprecedented times and uh, the health and safety of our community remains our number one priority. Chancellor, the, the next question uh, has to do with the financial impact of COVID-19. Let me read it for you, and I know you addressed it already, but it's worth reflecting on that a little bit more. COVID-19 has obviously had a financial impact on the university. What are the implications for the university, and what's our plan to address these challenges? Well, uh, let me start by saying, yes, uh, I tried to address this in my state of the university remarks uh, but let me just say succinctly, the financial effects of COVID-19 are real. They are certainly uh, significant. Uh, and since March, uh, we have been making contingency plans, as you well know, regarding our hiring uh, situation. We made that very, very clear as quickly as we can could. We made uh, every effort to try to keep people employed during the first phase of the pandemic back spring and during this semester. And we have an outstanding, I'm so pleased to have an outstanding financial planning team here at this university at the central level uh, and across the entire university. Uh, and as I said, budget challenges are not new. We've uh, had to face them before and we probably will have to face them again 
but we are committed as to working as hard as we can to protect our employees. And uh, Andreas, since I've kind of made my statements during the State of the University address, and I think most of you know that Provost Gangaleris is not only the chief academic officer, but has the oversight for our budget operations for the university as well. So uh, I'd be pleased if you could add some additional details about how we're approaching this whole financial challenge, both at the university level and what we might need to do at the state level as well. Happy to do so, Chancellor. And um, uh, you are indeed uh, correct that this is a, a unique challenge because um, um, in contrast to the uh, state budget impasse in, that we had to deal with uh, a few years ago, uh, which affected only our state appropriation portion of our budget, COVID-19 crisis is affecting uh, all our sources of revenue. Um, it affects our tuition. It affects our uh, cost for our auxiliaries. Uh, even I would argue that it affects our, uh, uh, our uh, gifts and our endowment. Uh, there's uncertainty out there that gets in the way. So uh, we have to be extra vigilant to make sure that uh, the way we prepare ourselves to continue delivering on our mission is mindful, mindful of the fact that we need to be uh, very concerned about uh, those sources of revenue. Uh, the state is going to be challenged, we know that. And uh, uh, thanks to um, the uh, very careful planning with uh, the experience from uh, the state uh, budget impasse, we have had resources that we've put aside to deal with another crisis like this. So a portion of any reduction from the state can be managed because of that planning ahead that we did four or five years ago. Second thing I wanted to say is that uh, uh, the uncertainty about uh, of the economy, it imp influences people's uh, uh, livelihoods and the ability of families to support the education of their students. So we are prepared to uh, set some of our, um, our uh, rainy funds, if you wish, to look after uh, ways in which we can ensure those students who want to come and be with us are not hindered by the financial stress. Uh, and I will say that uh, uh, we have been uh, successful in the past and we will continue to look after the well being of our community in the best possible way. Um, we have been in close conversations with all academic units, but all the units around campus to acknowledge the fact that we need to not only find ways in which we uh, we uh, mine our costs and keep them uh, as low as possible, but at the same time, any opportunities we have for uh, revenue generation through the things that are uh, key to our mission, teaching, research, are things that we prioritize and do our best to continue doing during this uh, next couple of years. Uh, we have dealt with crisis before successfully, and uh, I'm confident in this university to be able to deal with the crisis that we're going to be experiencing this year and uh, the next year and perhaps a couple of years down the road. So Chancellor, the next question I believe uh, is for you. Uh, we know that our university community members have a variety of viewpoints. How does our university balance freedom of speech with fostering a welcome and inclusive community, and especially during the pandemic. Thank you, Andreas. You know, this is uh, one of the most fundamental questions of our time. It's been fundamental historically, but I can tell you, I think at this point in our history, this is a question and a framework that we have to constantly come back and have discussion about and remind people of our values in this regard. Academic freedom, freedom of expression are bedrock principles of this university as a public research university and as a land grant institutions. Uh, we need to remind people that free and open exchange of ideas and information is really absolutely necessary to advance our democracy. But it's also at the absolute core of creating the new knowledge and being a catalyst for the research, discovery, and the innovation uh, that has come out of this university in the last 152 years 
and must continue to come out of this university for the betterment of our society. And it's all based on this, free, uh, this framework of academic freedom and freedom of expression. But at the same time, we also need to recognize that there's great diversity in our community and perhaps greater diversity, perhaps in any time in our history. It provides uh, an opportunity for there to be different perspectives put on the table and the talents and the life experiences of the different communities, oftentimes, uh, which is great because it fuels our creativity but it also advances the opportunity for us to have critical thinking and dialogue about these issues. And that's what we're supposed to do at a university. If you can't have these critical conversations in a university and be able to learn from them and impart that information as a part of the learning experiences of our students, then we're fundamentally missing part of our mission. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that we are free to dispute, we are free to debate, we are free to challenge ideas and perspectives and opinions of others. Uh, but the university must always stand against racism and religious intolerance and discrimination in any form. And we have to recognize that the lived experiences of everyone in this community is vitally important. We have to recognize that notwithstanding freedom of expression and freedom of expression and opinion and academic freedom, we have to recognize and provide a platform and an environment that we can have to find the ways to help people to disagree and have different respective perspectives, but to be respectful of each other. And I think there have been far too many times in the last several years where the ability to express your opinion, our opinion, different perspectives has ended up being very disrespectful and antithetical to, I think, the values that we've established for this university. So we got to find a way to get our arms around this to allow free expression, but to also do that in a way that's congruent with our values and that creates the kind of climate that is critically important for our students to live and to learn and for our faculty to work. And we have to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable or offensive or resort to the kinds of behavior that's antithetical to our views. It's a very difficult thing to do in this divisive climate in which we live, but we have to really roll up our sleeves and tackle this one head on as a community. Otherwise, we will be pushed away from our mission and most importantly, pushed away from providing the opportunity for our students to have the lived experiences that we promised them and to be their true authentic selves as a member of this university community. Thank you, Chancellor. Well said. Um, next question. What do we know about the rise of cases in our community? Is it being driven by our students? Allow me to answer this question, Chancellor. Uh, our increases in of cases in the community have been driven by the dramatic increase in the cases in East Central Illinois during this time period. Uh, I have been monitoring our increases. I'm comparing them to not only Champaign County, but Region 6. And it is striking to me that uh, on campus, we are right now about 0.4% positivity rate, where our um, uh, region six at 14% positivity rate. And, you know, from because of, this, of the thorough way in which we go about uh, applying our shield uh, ecosystem, from contact tracing, we can determine that uh, what we are seeing is not due to classroom or on the job transmission. The spread is um, likely to be through our uh, household or social contacts for all of us who live in the community. And this is why um, I'm, I want to repeat once again what we all know. It is so important for every one of us to be even more diligent in our personal lives right now as we prepare for, for next week's uh, Thanksgiving holiday, uh, looking after our, ourselves and our well-being uh, uh, our well 
uh, being careful with our uh, masking and social distancing, as well as staying the course with our testing is going to uh, protect us and protect uh, uh, the community as well. Let me move on, Chancellor, to the next question. Assuming there is a vaccine, what is the university's plan for trying to access and distribute it? Would we still conduct uh, COVID-19 testing when the vaccine becomes available? Yes, uh, well, we don't have to assume anymore that there's a vaccine. There are basically two, as we all know, and apparently both of those have an uh, efficacy above around 94, 95%. And in some of my conversations to, with some medical leaders today, I understand that there's probably going to be a third one that uh, is going to be reported to be about 99% effective. So we're going to have options in the uh, uh, around vaccination, and certainly uh, in partnership with others in the community, we will be playing a role and the distribution of those vaccines in a very, very timely way, helping out wherever we can, utilizing our expertise and our facilities to help with that deployment. Um, the vaccine is critically important, but we've been very, very clear that uh, with the vaccine, uh, that that's not going to be a panacea, uh, is not going to be necessary a quick uh, solution to uh, a rapid end to this pandemic. We fully anticipate based on what we're hearing from health experts that it's not going to be some automatic switch that will be flipped and automatically COVID-19 will disappear. And so we will still have to implement our, continue to implement our very innovative ecosystem with the modeling and the contact tracing and the testing we believe for at least the next 12 months, if not beyond. beyond, uh, We will be governed by, of course, as we learn more about the impact of the vaccine and its effectiveness in our community, as it roll out to essential workers and to students. But um, the accessibility to the testing, we think, I mean, is gonna be critically important. We're gonna be maintaining our COVID-19 testing and we will be working, as I said, with healthcare workers in this in the Champaign County to make sure that we have great clarity about when this is going to be available to our faculty, staff, and our students. So, Andreas, you have a perspective on this as well. I don't know if you want to comment, but it's really very exciting, folks. And sometimes I think it's almost, you know, kind of unbelievable because this is my understanding that this is the first time that a vaccine has been developed based on mRNA, first time in the history of this country. And I think that's one of the reasons for the efficacy that's much higher than what we've experienced with the flu. And also explain at least why one of these uh, vaccinations uh, has to be kept at a very low temperature, temperature in a minus 80 kind of environment, at least minus 70. But uh, it really does show the innovation that's being brought to bear on this uh, pandemic and the notion of creating the first mRNA based uh, vaccines is really just another sign of the innovation and the power of research and innovation that can be brought to bear on a critical problem. Councilor, uh, th there are two questions that I believe uh, uh, our audience would like answers to. So instead of me contributing my perspective on this, which is very similar to yours, let me move on with those two questions. Okay. And this is a key one. What's the plan for 2020 and 2021 graduation? Will there ever be in-person ceremonies? Well, uh, we certainly hope that there will be at some point. But let me just say succinctly, we plan to have graduations for the class of 2020 that was denied that face-to-face -face opportunity because of the pandemic. And we are still uncertain about the class of 2021. But let me just say simply, we will definitely have a graduation for both of these classes as soon as it's safe to do so. Because we know that that's part of the rite of passage and there's a, something that is critically important to our graduates to have the culmination of their educational experience with the big ceremony in the stadium. And I can tell you, I missed it last year 
and we will do all we can to bring that back when it's safe to do so because that's a critical part of the experiences that our students expect as they navigate this university for undergraduates and graduates and professional degrees. So as soon as we can, we will do it. Excellent. And the last question, Jandri. What is something you would like to say to future generations about the year 2020? Well, I'll just put it pretty quickly because I know we are out of time, but let me time, let me just say that I hope previous generations understand that um, notwithstanding all of the challenges that we know personally this pandemic has caused them to have to endure, that we first and foremost, this university has always put their health and safety first and will continue to do so. But I certainly hope that they will be the storytellers for future generations about the good and the bad that they had to endure during this year 2020 of COVID-19 and how they were able to step up personally and contribute to this university's ability to stay in place and to stay together and deliver the hybrid version of education that we promised them back in August and that they will be able to tell the story of the innovations that their university brought to bear in terms of creating a retrofitted ventilator that now has been sold by the, uh, given by the thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands in India to save lives about the innovative saliva test that allowed us all to stay safe in this community. And about all that's been done as a part of our commitment as a land grant university that we find solutions to complex problems and we really do on a regular basis and this is not hype we really do on a regular basis redefine what's impossible and actually this year in particular we've redefined what's fantasy and what can become reality i hope that those are the stories that they will go on to tell their children and their grandchildren to assure that we continue the narrative about the excellence of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Thank you so much. Well, with that response, we have reached the end of today's program. Thank you, Chancellor Jones, for your honest assessment of the state of the university. Thank you for your thoughtful responses to some of the most frequent questions members of our community are asking. And many thanks to all of you who were able to join us for today's State of the University Address. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank Heidi Johnson, who has been providing the live interpretation of today's speech and conversation for us. We will be posting the archived version of this to the web shortly. We will share that link when we have it ready. And this concludes our 2020 State of the University event today. Again, thank you all very much. I wish you a very good day and a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.